Hey guys, in this episode, I'm joined by Daria Oliva, the founder of the popular dance music brand Electric Hawk. Daryl and I chat about how he grew Electric Hawk from a blog built for sharing new music to a full-blown brand that now includes a record label, artist management services, consulting, and PR. Daryl also shares some tips for aspiring artists and gives advice for anyone looking to create their own company in this industry. With all that being said, let's get into it. Hey guys, welcome back to Rave Culture Cast, your weekly guide to the EDM community, music festivals, and more. I'm your host, Emma Capotis. Happy Wednesday, fam. I hope you all are doing well out there. Thank you all so much, let me just say off the top here, for all the love on last week's episode. You guys, I was a little nervous to put that one out. Uh, if you haven't listened yet, I gave a full update with all my thoughts and opinions on whether or not I think it's too soon for live events to return. Uh, and yeah, and I'm, I'm really happy you guys enjoyed that and heard me out and gave me a lot of feedback on it. So thank you all so much for, for listening to that. Um, I have a couple quick announcements before we get into today's interview, but I'm super excited for our guest today, you guys. Like I mentioned, Dariel is the founder of Electric Hawk. Some of you might know them. You might follow them on Twitter, on social media. Um, they have an incredible new music playlist that they always put out and it's a brand I've been following for years now and I, I was just sort of really curious their whole history and how he started everything because um, they've really been exploding in this past year in particular and after talking to Daryl they have a lot of plans for the future so it's all really really exciting and I'm you know I'm excited for him to tell you his story and how he built everything these past few years so that is what is coming up on today's episode. But before we dive in, you guys, I got a couple of really exciting announcements, so buckle up. Alrighty, first and foremost, honestly, these are all important, but I gotta start with this one because I'm so excited about it. Okay, I finally created a Discord group for this podcast, you guys. A few of you have asked me to create one, like, I don't know, over the past few months, but I finally was like, you know what, I'm gonna pull the trigger and do it. I'm only a part of one other Discord group, so I don't know that much about it, but so far, it's been awesome, and it's popping off, you guys. So if you are not familiar with Discord, it's essentially like a messaging platform or an app. Um, so it's like way more, it's updated way more frequently. It's kind of like texting each other. So I created all of these different channels on the Rave Culture Cast Discord group. So there's like channels for Find a Rave Fam, East Coast Ravers, West Coast Ravers, all different festivals, fashion tips, like you name it, I created a channel for it. So I just really want to con continue creating a safe space for this community and allowing you guys to connect with each other, form relationships and friendships, find people to go to shows with, talk about the episodes, like give me feedback, all of that good stuff. So, you know, we have the Facebook group community, which is incredible for sharing links and, and doing all fun things over there. But the Discord group is a little bit more um, active on a daily basis if you guys like really want to chat and connect with people. So there will be a link in the show notes now for that moving forward. Second major announcement, if you are watching on YouTube, you might see I'm wearing a piece of the new merch collection, which is officially going to be launching on Wednesday, April 21st. I'm doing it, you guys. It's ready. Uh, this is called the Plur Mini Collection. So essentially, I have been sitting on these designs since last August, and I loved how they came out so much. I decided to just launch a Plur collection. So essentially I designed these different designs that say peace, love, unity, respect, and then I created the little Plur logo as well, and I've got this white hoodie, I've got long sleeves, t-shirt, tote bag, face mask, a mug, tank top. So there's a whole bunch of stuff coming out. I'm so excited for it. Um, you know, the first collection was all black, so I included some white items in this as well, and it's gonna look crisp. Um, so that is launching Wednesday, April 21st. Super, super excited about it. I hope you guys all enjoy it. Okay, last thing I wanted to mention that some of you guys might be interested in, if you guys are interested in podcasting or you have ever considered starting a podcast and you just want to learn more um, or you've always put it off and like you just can't seem to figure out or find the time of when to do it, this next message is for you. 
So I have gotten into online coaching. I launched my first online course in January and I knew that the next one I was gonna do was gonna be on podcasting because this is such a huge passion of mine. So my next course is gonna be launching at the end of this month and it is going to be your step-by-step -step guide to creating a podcast from scratch. So it will be launching at the end of April. Enrollment, I believe, is gonna open for the course on April 12th. It'll be open for two weeks, and in that time, you can enroll. Um, but before all that kicks off, I'm gonna be hosting a free webinar, totally free, you guys. You can just pop in, and it's gonna be on the top things you should know before starting a podcast. So these are all things I wish I knew before I got started, um, and I hope that it gives you words of encouragement and it just fills you in on things before you jump into this journey of creating your own podcast, which I highly, highly recommend. It's been the best thing ever. So that free webinar is gonna be on Tuesday, April 13th at 8 p.m. Eastern. I will put a link in the show note to RSVP to that event. It's just gonna be a Zoom meeting and I'll do a whole presentation and I hope it's gonna be you know jam-packed with information for you guys. So those two things are happening. I hope to see you in the webinar or I really, really hope to work with you in the course. It's gonna be amazing. More information to come on that down the line. All right, you guys, that is everything. Uh, really quickly, my affirmation for the week. I, I think I skipped this the last two weeks and I need to bring it back because I'm feeling in a really good mood today and we could use a, a daily affirmation today. So this one is very fitting right now. Today's affirmation is trust the timing of your life. Trust the timing of your life. I could not agree with this sentiment more than right now. There are so many things happening and sometimes we like to rush things, sometimes we like to force things, sometimes we question why things happen and you just have to re-center yourself and focus on the fact that things are happening for you, not to you. Everything will happen in its due time. Have a little bit of patience, have a little bit of trust if something doesn't work out the way you thought it should, I'm telling you it means something better was meant for you. So I have to remind myself a lot about this. Trust the timing of your life. It's all going to be good, you guys. All right, with all that being said, thanks for sticking with me through this intro. Please join me in welcoming Daryl Leva to the podcast. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being here. I am super excited that we could connect. Uh, one thing I wanted to say right off the bat here is that I... One thing I love about this podcast is that it allows me to connect with people that I think are really inspiring in the community. And I have been following Electric Hawk for, I don't even know how long now. And it's been really cool to see the growth of your company. So I want to, you know, know the story about how that all got started, but also just hear your story. And yeah. And for anybody listening who wants to be in like a similar position to you, you know, just hear how you got here basically. So with all that being said, please join me in welcoming Daryl to the podcast. How you doing? I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Um, yeah, I mean, going into like the background of like Electric Hawk and really just my personal background with everything, um, we take a lot of pride in just being a very grassroots organization overall. Mm -hmm. uh, most of us have little to no experience uh, when it comes to music industry stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, personally, me, um, I had no idea what I was doing. And I love saying this, but like, frankly, not many people know what they're ever doing in this industry, which is cool because it's a very dynamic and rapidly changing scene, but also an industry where, you know, there's new marketing tactics, there's new things to focus on, like there's new strategies that are, you know, people are using every day where you need to stay creative, stay up to date with the trends, but also to just realize what's working, what's, what's not working. Mm -hmm. Um, so I guess kind of like going in my background with Electric Hawk. Um, we started this about, uh, I'd say like two, three years ago or so. Uh, mm -hmm. I just started it by myself. Um, with Electric Hawk, we kind of just established it as just a blog. Or when I say we, I just mm -hmm. mean me. Um, I was going to say, <laughs> was it just you or was there a team here? <laughs> it was just me back then for sure. Okay. So with Electric Hawk, I knew that I wanted to do something with music. I knew I wanted to have some kind of creative control over a platform to share music. And uh, really with Electric Hawk, I thought, okay, well, I feel like I'm good at writing. So I'm going to start a blog mm -hmm. uh, and kind of just go from there. And like, I, again, did had no idea what I was doing. I knew how to write, 
but I didn't know how to write about music, I guess this is a better okay. way to put it. Yeah. So trial by error, you know, and it comes to just kind of putting yourself into the fire when it comes to this. So as the kind of Twitter started to grow and like I started to write more and more about different things and just whatever kind of piqued my interest as a single blog and single one blog, I kind of also started to feel like I didn't like the format of how current blogs were at the time in like 2017, 2018 were mm-hmm. Just like handling like coverage by that. Mm-hmm. I mean, like I would go on Twitter. I'm on, I used to go on Twitter, still kind of am 24 seven. So mm-hmm. with this kind of platform, I thought, well, I don't want to just like write a boring headline and then post it and just like mm-hmm. keep it moving. That's not attractive to me. Cause like, I really was feeling like there was a lack of like a platform that was very more universal, uh, covered a lot of things, both the underground and a lot of the mainstream things that are ongoing. Mm -hmm. But also it didn't feel like there was a voice that resonated with me. So I felt like I had to kind of develop that voice. Mm -hmm. Um, So in a sense, I figured out, I guess, a way to kind of get our platform boosted up on Twitter. And that's by... uh, posting nonsense and silly things and stuff like that. And AKA shit posting. So (laughs) um, that's kind of like how we started to get most of our name is like, just like cracking jokes or like making things that were relevant and then getting the name out there and just getting the impressions overall boosted up to where we could constantly build up this engagement and then kind of slide in the important content, if that makes sense with these Mm -hmm. blogs. So that was kind of the strategy developed. Over time, more and more people kind of started following the Twitter account. It kind of became a bit of a phenomenon for people. Just Mm -hmm. like a troll, who is this guy? Kind of like a a funny festival at this point. And And this is just you at this point, right? Just me at this point. Just you. Okay. Awesome. Continue. Sorry. (laughs) And um, really what kind of happened from there is just more and more people started to like really love like the brand and the vision and approach in general. Mm -hmm. To where I started getting emails like, hey, I want to join this team. Like, I don't know what you want me to do. I don't know what I can do for you, but I want to be part of this. Mm -hmm. Over time, I kind of started, you know, being just a team by myself. Like you need when it comes to an organization like this, Mm -hmm. you need to trust people and like allow them to kind of like, you know, if you really want to expand and make a difference in this community, it takes a village. Like you can't do any of this by yourself. Mm -hmm. Um, so I kind of started, you know, vetting people and just making sure that like, based off of like what their social media, like behavior was and like, were they like really people that I felt like represented what I'm trying to represent here? Mm -hmm. Um, when it comes to, do they have a diverse music taste? Are they, you know, very passionate? That's the very important thing about what this is. I don't care if they're experienced. I don't care if they have some kind of bachelor's degree in like music production or you know, technical skills or anything like that. The most important thing to me, and it still is to this day, is how passionate are you about it? Because just like how it is for me is like, I'm super passionate about everything that I do when it comes to this. Mm -hmm. So that passion will lead you to learn what you need to, uh, whatever it is, VJ, video production, graph design, music production itself, how to write, how to Mm -hmm. manage a record label, stuff like that. If you're passionate, you'll find out how to do it and you'll learn yourself. You'll it's, it's going to be natural to teach yourself that. So that's the most important trait that I found in people trying trying to build this team in the early days and still to this day. Yeah. I could not agree with you more by the way, but I I literally felt like I was just talking when you just said that, because I totally agree with you. I think, excuse me, when you're, when you are passionate about things, like you said, you find a way to make it happen or you're just so excited to learn new things, but taking it back a little bit to the beginning, were you, into blogs at the time or like what was your background with any of that or did you just decide that was the best format at the time no my background i I never really followed blogs at the time i know there was kind of like a very bleak era for music publications and dance music in particular uh where nest hq for example was like the hottest thing back then and then they Mm kind of just dissolved and disappeared and haven't come back and that was kind of like everyone's favorite at the time now it's kind of just dominated by your edm.com edm.com and Mm -hmm. flux of it flux of it kind of being the biggest source for like underground artists but their kind of curation was more geared towards trap music so they weren't really covering everything but they were definitely a gold mine for that unique kind of genre Mm -hmm. um your edm and edm.com they were just covering very mainstream things that like you know like just yeah yeah. so Mm -hmm. There was a very big void. Um, and uh, with my kind of background, I guess, going into it, I mean, 
Yeah, I wasn't into blogs. I had never really read up with blogs. Mm-hmm. I just did it. I felt like it needed to be done. So I kind of just started it up and rolled with the punches and yeah. from there, you know, figure it out on, along the way. And we're still figuring out every single day. So, yep. I was going to say, yeah, you just learned along the way. And the important thing is that you just started it and didn't hold off, didn't like wait for the right time or anything. You just started it, which is awesome. You actually mentioned, um, well, let me ask this first. So, has your taste in music evolved? Like back then when you first started it, like you mentioned, did you have a lot of knowledge about the music industry? Did you like certain artists? And like, how has that evolved over time? Oh man. (laughs) Um, Yeah, the taste in music has evolved immensely. I mean, being from just the blog and now we're agency and a record label. So like the kind of like the purpose of what my ear has to be used for Mm -hmm. has changed dramatically from being just like trying to rate, like, I guess, cover music in a positive light to now. okay, I'm trying to look for the next best thing actively every single day. So my kind of, I guess, instinct and my next, my I guess my objective when I'm listening to music on a daily basis now is like, it's kind of changed in both positive and negative ways. Uh, mm-hmm. By positive, I mean, like, I mean, I'm, I'm always looking for, I'm always approaching it as an A&R approach, essentially. Uh, so that means that like, I'm looking for the potential whenever I listen to a track, I'm looking for you know, why is this artist going to be, you know, someone that we want to work with moving forward. And I really start kind of picking like exactly the best traits in that artist and figuring out how we can develop them. The negative kind of part of that has been kind of like, it it kind of takes the fun out of listening to music sometimes, um, which is kind of like a hard thing to kind of deal with in a position of like being an AR because like, you know, kind of like some of the magic kind of leaves away when Mm -hmm. you feel like you're listening to music because it's a business now. It's no yeah. longer a fun thing. So I kind of just uh, listen to all my old comfort and like old favorite songs now, kind of like keep that enjoyment up though. So, yeah, no, I'm just, I'm asking because I, I wonder for anybody else, like who wants to get into this industry or wants to start something from scratch, like who might be sitting there and look at people in these positions and be like, Oh my gosh, they must have so much knowledge. They must know people, all these connections, but I don't think people realize like everybody starts from somewhere and starts from scratch. So I just was yeah, curious at the time when you started this blog, you know, like what level of knowledge you had to just like jump into it, you know, or was well, it just the passion? Yeah. I mean, I, I had, so I, I guess kind of like when it comes to the technical, like, I guess, productions of like what I could do. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, it's not my first kind of rodeo, like starting an organization before, before electric Hawk, uh, I kind of like helped with a hip hop blog in Chicago called mad artists for probably like a couple of months. It was mm-hmm. kind of the same concept, not as diverse as we're on now, of course, mm-hmm. like a team of three or four people. We were just doing hip hop blog coverage. And I kind of got, I guess my taste of what we have now. Mm-hmm. Um, before then I had another company called 1B1LB that I started and that was more towards like esports and competitive online gaming. And like, I kind of got the idea of like how to run an organization and a team of people, uh, mm-hmm. myself, like individually, um, through that kind of venture before we kind of ended up dissolving it a couple of years later. So it, it, all that kind of experience over the years has kind of given me like video production knowledge, like graphic design, very useful tools that have definitely been in use every single day for Electric mm-hmm. Hawk to this day. So I bet. Yeah. OK, so then talk a little bit about the growth, like you said. So once you start, people started reaching, <clears throat> reaching out to you on the Twitter account, but you mentioned who you were looking for. Who were those first few hires? Were they writers? And then how how did it keep growing from there. Cause I know you have a ton of staff now on the, <laughs> on yeah. your website. So at first I reached out to Nick Resnick. Uh, he was kind of like an active, also like very popular and engaging person on Twitter. And like, mm-hmm. that's what I was looking for is like someone to help me continue that voice on Twitter as well and kind of collaborate on that. Mm-hmm. Um, again, like that's, I never like approach people or like I guess I never vetted people as in like, what are you capable of doing? Mm -hmm. I always vetted them as in, what are you wanting to do and how bad do you want to do? That's, those are the main questions. Um, So the first few people was Nick Resnick and then Hunter Stromquist. She's currently on the team as a program manager. Uh, She, they were joined on the team like late 2017 and they, I just asked them to join because I needed help. I didn't know what I needed help with because Mm -hmm. 
we were just a blog at the time, still figuring it out. I think I asked him to join as soon as we had started our Lusher Cock Radio SoundCloud guest mix series. Okay. That was crucial uh, at the beginning stages because if it weren't for that radio mix series, we wouldn't have had guest mixes like Raven's Coon or Mize or uh, Recno uh, or Space Wizard on the podcast who are now like insanely huge artists to mm-hmm. this day. So we kind of established our grassroots and like our foundation and like the network of artists that we're cool with and like still friends with today that have connected us with even more artists and more labels and more partnerships uh, over time. Um, as that kind of expanded and we realized that we wanted to keep growing the publication side instead of just the radio mix side, I started just asking other friends of friends if they want to join. So like Hunter and Nick would be like, yeah, I know this person or they they're interested in writing. They don't know what they're doing either, but Mm -hmm. they want to help and they love the brand. So it ended up kind of turning into just like a friend of a friend. We keep inviting more people to the team and we would kind of just, you know, like we would again, just try it. We would kind of lay down processes and document everything as well, making sure that like we're doing everything as best as possible and fine tuning every kind of corner that we can kind of turn and making sure that we are delivering the best content possible for this organization Mm -hmm. with what we had. Eventually over the, I'd say 2018, uh, the team kind of grew from being just like three people at the beginning of 2018 to I think like 20, two people towards fall of 2018. Um, At that point, the publication has been blowing up. We Mm -hmm. went from being like ranked like, I don't know, like over like 3.1.3 million uh, globally to ended up being like 200,000 globally ranked. So the website just blew up. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. That's a huge jump. That's so cool. It's it's just so interesting to hear like the journey. Um, and I know the team like works extremely hard. Like there just always seems to be new updates coming out of you guys. And I'm glad you touched on Twitter as well. That was a question I thought about today, but yeah, Twitter has just been such a huge part of your journey. You guys, you have a, you personally and the account have like a very big following. So I was just going to ask your thoughts in general on the platform and how that's worked for you promotion wise versus like, let's say Instagram or TikTok, anything like that. Twitter has always been the forte um, for me, even like before Electric Hawk, like I always would try and post funny things for, you know, myself uh, on my personal account. So it became very natural. And that's where most of our following was from. Uh, Facebook's definitely like our weakest platform, but our Instagram now, because of like our marketing team, like Tate Mm -hmm. and Anna and Sammy and Ashley, like they're all doing, they're crushing it. Like we've been gaining a huge following on Instagram now as well. And just figuring stuff out like that, but really the brunts and like the face of electric Hawk has always been like the silliness and just the overall, like just being genuine and not being like a, a regular blog. Like we wanted to be seen as like genuine people who love this scene, who love artists, who love everything about it and just want to be ourselves. And I think at the core, that's what matters at the end of this day is that like act operating as genuine people rather than just a brand, some kind of Mm -hmm. company logo on Twitter where you can directly connect with people in real time was essential because we got to make those relationships and those connections with people that are more long lasting. So anything that we said, people kind of held it more valued rather than just some, you know, some logo tweeting out a link to an article. It was different. It was a genuine person trying to connect and share music that they really cared about with a new audience. And people saw that. And I'm really, really appreciative of that kind of space that we had to build on. Yeah. Yeah. I was gonna say clearly it resonated with the community, which is awesome. Yeah. There's just something about Twitter that I wrote down sharing music is my love language. It's seriously, it is, it has been. I was like the type of person who was always making mix CDs for friends and family. Like that was my jam. And now I just feel like there's something about dance music that lends itself to, to just, that's a part of the culture, right? Like that's just a huge part of it. You have all these different playlists people share around, but I think Twitter also just makes it easier as a format in general, just to connect with people. And there's a huge EDM Twitter community as well. So I don't know, have you always been the type of person to share music with other people? Like, are you the guy who's like on the aux cord first? (laughs) Yeah. I mean, that's kind of like the whole mission statement that uh, I kind of like have coined for electric hog. Like since I created it is that like we keep, I keep repeating it. I sound like a broken record to people, Mm -hmm. but I really mean it. And like, I want it to stick is the whole music sharing culture is what it's built on. Mm -hmm. So 
by that, uh, it's kind of like an umbrella kind of experience with that kind of statement. I want mm. to put together a community of people, whether it's through this team or through the fans of this organization or anyone that supports us to just be proud of everything you share. I love sharing music all the time. I, I would make playlists for my friends as well. I would love to get on the ox cord in the car on the way to a festival. <laughs> yeah. If the Bluetooth speaker is open at a campsite before we walk into the venue at like electric <laughs> horse or something, yeah. give me that, you know, like. I'm happy about it. And I'm trying to find people just like myself because I know if I have that mindset, there are so many other people just like me that are happy about sharing that kind of music and proud of it and like wear it on your sleeve. It mm -hmm. was kind of developed, like, I guess, a, a, I felt like this whole organization was kind of built upon a problem that I felt like was going on in our scene. And that was kind of just like the music elit elitism that's been kind of going on for mm -hmm. so many years. Mm -hmm. By that, I mean, kind of like, um, there, there's sometimes like fan bases that kind of feel like, you know, I, I cause I've been there myself personally, like mm -hmm. I can, I can understand how easy it is to get in there, but like, if you can get, uh, I guess integrated into a fan base or a kind of community of people within the, the dance music scene mm -hmm. where you only like a specific type of bass music and everything else is just bad yep. because yep. your friends, yeah, <laughs> see, mm -hmm. yep. so everything else is just <laughs> bad because like your friends kind of told you that. So you just kind of right. think that. Um, and then eventually you kind of just grow up and you realize like, you know what? I love house music. I love techno. I love other stuff. Why was mm -hmm. I just, you know, going to bass music shows with this group of friends the whole time? Like there's so much to explore out there. So trying to find a community of people who think the same way, like be proud of everything that you listen to screaming from the top of the mountains, as mm -hmm. long as you care about it and you're passionate about it, that's what you are. You're part of this music sharing culture. I love that. Yep. No, I totally, I couldn't agree with you more. And I think there's also a part of that too, where I try to go really easy on people is like, just because you get further into the dance music scene too, like say you're somebody who has been raving or doing something for 10 years versus people who just get into it. Like, I think sometimes there can be um, people like the elitism with people who are older in the scene versus younger, because like sometimes people just don't know where their taste evolves over time. And like, just because people just getting into the scene want to go to main stage or only know the main headliner is like, that's not their fault. They just got into the scene. Like they will discover what they like over time. So I think there's a part of it too. Just it's a huge part of this community in general, just accepting people and not judging them and allowing them to like what they like and, you know, not picking on anybody for that. So I appreciate that. That's a huge part of your culture. And that leads us into the next chapter for you. When did the record label come into the picture? When was this like, okay, this is going to be the next step for us. I love talking about this. I mean, it, it was definitely a very pivotal, pivotal moment for us. Mm -hmm. um, so when the record label was established, uh, this kind of idea came for me. I know like I've been wanting to start a record label because A, I, I well, just the main reason is because I want to do more for this scene and the artists that we work with. I, mm -hmm. I felt like a blog and the radio mix just wasn't enough. I Like I felt like this is a fast track way to, you know, invest into the artists that we care about and mm -hmm. really push them out and like help them develop their careers and connect with people and like make this their full-time thing in the mm -hmm. future. And like, it's, it's cool to see that like the impacts have been made for a lot of people already. The uh, idea for the record label uh, kind of like started going into actual development um, after Electric Force 2018 what happened was we had a specific small silent disco takeover. We were a fraction of the size that we were back then or mm -hmm. now, but Panky Ring, um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with like that, those RV stages that they do at Electric mm -hmm. Forest, but they're like one of the main like camp, sound camp stages. Okay. And basically when I reached out to them at Ben, uh, at Panky Ring, the owner, mm -hmm. I was like, hey, can we do like a takeover or something? Like I, I was kind of like just shooting my shot in the dark and mm -hmm. they said, yeah, we're doing a silent disco stage this year. Like the official electric forest after party one, uh, you can get like one set a night if you work it, you know? Yeah. So I had to work like eight hours a day every <laughs> night <laughs> to do that. <laughs> I didn't care. I just wanted to yeah. get more involved. Like I took the opportunity. So it was cool because I got artists some sets on there that I cared about. But secondly, and most importantly, I kind of like really got to look at people in the faces and like figure out like I'm not doing enough for you. Like I don't want you on the silent disco stage. And mm -hmm. like that's not my goal for Electric Hawk. I want you to be in the big venue over there, like right, on that right. big stage. Yep. So moving from that, um, got home, started putting together the plans on how a record label works. 
Googling everything possible, figuring out what to do, and then putting together our first compilation album as a debut. And then along came the very viral marketing strategy that we did with just like Mm -hmm. everyone changing the profile pictures at coordinated time and really just making sure that this debut was like something to remember. Mm -hmm. Um, And ever since then with In Harmony, kind of like developed the metaphor for that as well, where like In Harmony, it's like the hand and the feather, which is like the artwork of the logo, Mm -hmm. the hand representing us, you know, you and I, the fans, the team, people trying to uplift the artists and the feather representing the music and the artists in this industry as well. I love that. That's so cool. Yeah. So really quickly, I want to ask you a little bit about Electric Forest because you brought it up a couple of times. How many times have you attended? Is that your favorite festival? Yeah, that's my favorite for sure. It's uh, I've gone there three years already, not three years in a row, um, okay. but since 2016, I believe. Yeah. Ooh, so, okay. I haven't attended yet. 2020 was supposed to be my first electric forest and my first camping festival, but uh, any, any tips or advice for attending that one? I can't wait. <laughs> It's, it's definitely a marathon. Uh, they start Wednesday, of course, now, uh, that's mm-hmm. kind of like a recent kind of thing, but, yep. um, definitely, you know, it's, it's, it's a marathon, not a race for sure. There's so <laughs> much to do, uh, for us that night is unbelievable, but definitely, you know, like make sure to take some time to just grab a hammock and chill out wherever, you know, like do mm-hmm. go with the vibe and don't follow the crowd, do what you want to do, because ultimately like you're going to run into some amazing experiences just exploring on your own. So, mm-hmm. And would you say too, like, are you more of a fan when you're attending events now, or are you still working an event? Would you say like, are you just still, or is it a little bit of both? I think I'm still mostly a fan. I've only really attend events when, you know, like I, I genuinely like want to support and like buy a ticket and like mm-hmm. go see the lineup for sure. Um, I get that again. It's like, now because of how much we've grown over this past year during a pandemic as well we've Mm -hmm. blown up during you know during no physical events were happening right i don't know how exactly my mindset's going to be getting back into events once we do start doing them again Mm -hmm. um i just feel like i will be there but for the most part it'll be for like work work things whether it's Mm -hmm. me djing or helping with like production there or something like that like i feel like it's definitely going to be more so of a business approach, but I mean, I'll never stop going to shows that I love either way though. So yeah, of course, of course. And it's a good way to discover music too. I I would say one thing I really liked about the electric um, forest lineup in particular is they have such a diverse lineup as well. So I'm sure you'll also just like hear something that like catches your ear and it's like, maybe we could bring them on to the electric (laughs) Hawk team or a future compilation or something like that in the future. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So you actually just touched on it, but I wanted to talk about this past year and how that's affected you guys, because were you always, did you ever have like an office or was the team kind of spread out anyway, like all working pretty much from home? We've been mostly spread out. Uh, we've all been working from home. Uh, everyone I'd say most of the team is in the Midwest or the East coast. We don't really have much people over in the West coast or like Arizona. Like we had a few, uh, people that are like no longer in the team. Um, but like, you know, just most of us like are from the Midwest or the East coast. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I guess with this kind of past year on how things have kind of developed with electric hawk, it's like, we've always been like a, a virtual, like digital brand and experience mm-hmm. like we never were doing live live events like we like you know we started mm-hmm. as being a publication then a record label mm-hmm. and then the kind of passion just didn't stop there like over this past right. year like we started forming an agency so now we're doing consultation artist development we're doing marketing rollout strategies we're we're doing everything that we've learned and applying it to artists that need to know this kind of stuff Mm -hmm. or PR. And now we're an artist management company as well. So like I manage artists myself, there's other people on the team like Tate as well, who Mm -hmm. also beyond being a marketing director on Electric Hawk is also managing Zingara and Bad Habit. So it's like, we're all trying to do everything we can basically for this scene. So um, it's been a wonderful past year kind of just developing and growth and figuring out what we want to do. That's really cool to hear. Yeah. I think I'm curious to get your opinion on this because I feel like when the pandemic was first happening, I remember thinking to myself, I had talked to some artists too, and they were like, we don't really know what the strategy now is going to be for releasing music. Like, are we pushing album releases back? Are we not releasing right now? Like it just, there was so much uncertainty when it was first happening, but then I feel like cut to a couple months. I feel like it, it went away. It picked up music was starting to come out like crazy. Now we have live streams. Everyone's live streaming every single weekend. There's like 
absolutely no shortage of that. So what were you guys seeing on your end when this was like first kicking off? Like what was your response when this was first happening? A lot of friends of ours, I mean, they kind of also had the same questions for, it was a good like month or two where like people are like, what do we do? And Mm -hmm. like, even like our mentors, like, or people that like we look up to, like we reached out to them and they're like, honestly, like I haven't been a pandemic in a pandemic before. (laughs) Yeah. You haven't been a pandemic before. So you're, whatever you're asking me, I have the same questions too. So I'm like, all right, well, guess we're in this together. So yep, yep. I guess the rollout of like release strategies and whatnot, like it's definitely changed a little bit, but not, I I think it's more so what people are putting out. I think this, the strategy Mm -hmm. of how people still put things out is still the same. People Mm -hmm. still want new music. Um, but I know currently, and I'm expecting this year because of that reason, there's going to be so many artists that have been stacking up on wonderful music over this past year, but mm-hmm. they've been hesitant to drop it because if they release this music, the kind of cycle of how relevant it is realistically mm-hmm. can only last for so long. Mm-hmm. Artists typically in most of dance music, they try to make music and they release it where they're going to be able to tour off of it or play shows off of it. So Mm -hmm. if it's like an album tour or uh, maybe it's like a hit song that like so many clubs are going to play and so many artists are playing, like Mm -hmm. it's kind of risky to release that in the middle of a pandemic and knowing that you won't really be able to fully capitalize on that for who knows how long. So Mm -hmm. that's definitely something that we should expect to see this coming year. And the next year, there's going to be albums just dropping left and right from dope artists that we like from underground artists. And there's going to be a huge influx of artists trying to capitalize on those releases and trying to develop tours for that, or just the string of shows where they can make sure that when they release it, it is timed perfectly. And, you know, the fans will be able to feel like that's a relevant kind of piece as well. Yep. I totally agree with you on the, on the touring. That's what I was thinking in my head as well. And I like always think back to the different memes or like TikToks I've seen where people are like all of the fire releases that came out this year. And you're telling me, I I haven't heard this in a club yet. Like you gotta be kidding me. (laughs) It's like ridiculous. We need to get out there. And some of it, I feel like a lot of artists too, like sometimes they make their tracks and release them specifically because they, they know it's made for a large audience or a festival or like something like that. And they still have not had the opportunity, you know, in most cases to play them. I know the whole, um, David Guetta and Morton project, which I love, um, the future rave project they did. I know I heard them talking about like, this is made, this is made for like a festival crowd, the clubs. Um, so I'm, I'm excited to, to hear what kind of carries over, but I'm right there with you on, I can't wait for the new albums and music people are going to release going into the second half of this year. But would you ever consider, I had this in my notes, would you ever consider doing a, or seeing an electric Hawk festival in the future? We're putting that together right now, actually. Um, ah, that's so exciting. Yeah. <laughs> um, based off of the Harmony virtual festivals that we're doing and just the amount of insane support and love and just mm-hmm. the connections that we built off of these virtual like audio visual experiences like it's been insane because like this whole past year like we've just absolutely blown up and it's been so strange and just bittersweet because like a lot of our friends, like they haven't been able to tour, but like we've been able to kind of provide this platform where like we could do these live streams, pay them Mm -hmm. several hundreds of of, several, several hundreds of dollars sometimes, or like Mm -hmm. they get viewerships of like thousands of people watching their sets. And it's just like, it wasn't crazy. It was crazy. And Mm -hmm. we kind of developed those relationships with these artists that we would have never, I guess, have, been connected with if it weren't for right. a harmony virtual festival so yeah. now kind of the next step is to capitalize on all the growth that we've had last year all the relationships that we've built because there's so many artists that want to keep working with us so mm-hmm. it's going to be a very seamless transition when we're trying to develop a live event space once things are safe again so with harmony festival uh the irl one now is mm-hmm. what we're gonna, um we're we're kind of looking at locations right now and we're working with different uh, uh kind of like festival directors and trying to get advice and mentorship it's going to be our first festival of course so yeah. we need all the help we can get um it's cool we're kind of like getting all this advice from like other people that have done their own festivals like mm-hmm. very active in the scene and generally like there's already like a bunch of artists that like catch up with me and they're like hey when you do that festival, can you please book me? Like they're <laughs> yeah. asking me. So of course, yeah. 
It's cool. We're, we're definitely putting out together. And on top of that, just in general, just excited to get back into the live event space officially because we never mm-hmm. really got to do that. We were going to uh, be on some festival takeovers and do our own like live city takeovers uh, mm-hmm. last summer, but everything got canceled. So yeah, yeah. I was going to say for you, definitely the sky is the limit because like what you just mentioned, even just doing stage takeovers at larger events, but then to bring it into your own, I have to come to that. Whenever that happens, I'm definitely going to be in attendance because I would love to see what you guys uh, put together. But um, question about artists, if there's any artists or aspiring producers listening, what would you recommend to them? Because like you said, you listen to a lot of music and I'm sure your team is out there looking at people all the time, but like has anything stood out to you in this past year or have you ever, have you seen any artists you're like, Ooh, that's really interesting. Or they have a really great marketing strategy. And that really stood out to you. The best things that stick out to me personally, and also frankly, a lot of like people that are like mentors and just friends of us that Mm -hmm. are running like much larger labels and like, you know, like milestone labels, basically Mm -hmm. they, everyone and like including me like we we kind of just operate off of like just genuineness genuineness and Mm -hmm. loyalty by that i mean when you're releasing or submitting music to a specific organization whether it's a blog as well or a label Mm -hmm. do you are you sending that just because you're trying to get it released are you sending it because you believe in the platform that you're sending it to Mm -hmm. now ways you can kind of i guess work up to that impression and develop that relationship is kind of like taking the steps to make yourself known and familiar with the team behind it. And, you know, your music can be amazing, but ultimately if the team doesn't know you, and I'm not saying that like, you don't, you know, have to like, you have to physically know me. Mm -hmm. I mean, like if the team just isn't familiar and they don't trust you or they don't, you know, they don't have an understanding that you're someone worth investing in the long while, then that release might get turned down. Um, so unless your music is like, absolutely like insanely godlike, like you're the next bloom (laughs) by far. And like everyone can tell, then yeah, a label is going to jump on you. But if not, you can still get your foot in the door by just being a good, a good person and a good fan and a good supporter of the organization that you're sending your music to. So Mm -hmm. a couple of different ways to kind of go about it. And definitely the best advice that I love giving out to people is you want to get familiar. And by that, I mean, Find out who the team is behind this organization, whether mm-hmm. it's Electric Hawk, whether it's Deadbeats or Recon, and interact with them on social medias. Find out their Twitter. They're out there. They all have Twitter so Twitter accounts. Like mm-hmm. they're all on Twitter all the time. Find their Instagram. Engage with them. Comment on them. Be nice. You know, interact. Yeah, Don't be yeah. invasive, but just get your name there. Get your name in their head. Mm-hmm. So when you make that first official impression and you send that email pitch saying, hey, I love everything you're doing. I'm a huge fan. I follow you on Twitter. Like you're an awesome person. Mm-hmm. I would love nothing more than to you to hear these couple of demos that I've worked on for the last couple of months for consideration for your label or blog. And immediately if I'm going to be on the other end of that as Electric Hawk or the a and person, mm-hmm. I'm going to think, yeah, this person's really cool. I see them on social media all the time. Like they've got some really dope stuff. You know what? I'm going to listen to this demo mm-hmm. and I'm going to give it the time of day. If I accept it, boom, you're in. Yep. Yep. I, that's really, really great advice. Everybody take notes. I can hear people writing down (laughs) what you should do. Uh, I totally agree with you. I think it's about building connections and making that extra effort in my head. I was just thinking it's the difference between, uh, you mass applying for jobs and changing a couple words versus actually really, really wanting to work at a place, writing a cover letter and like being interested in the employer. So I think like, I can't even imagine how many emails you guys get from people who want you to do something for them rather than the other way around, you know? So I think that's huge advice. And I know even um, Zingara, for example, like she's building an incredible community on TikTok. So there, I think there are ways that you can just focus on building your community or you see these artists out there hustling with their live streams and like commit commitment, like they are committing, they're doing multiple days a week. They're building an audience to the point where they grow enough that Labels also take notice, I'm sure, as well. So I think that's really, really, really good advice for any artist listening. And um, I just have a couple more questions here before we wrap up. Uh, What would you say? Okay, so we talked festival, label. What are some other projects you guys are working on? Or what would you say is like your main focus that you're the most excited about right now? 
Main focus is definitely uh, the Harmony Festival right now. I mean, we have a couple other things we're kind of just like tweaking with the label at the moment and just restructuring, just fine tuning to make sure that, you know, we're fully investing in releases that, you know, we care about. So as in like, we're trying to get more of the team involved, uh, you know, opening the doors because again, this is, you know, this is like a very big team and like we're all figuring this out together. And like, so with this team being like 35 plus people at the moment, like we're trying to involve more people in the A&R process who are interested. We're trying to show them how the distribution process works and how to really, you know, find releases and how we do that. Uh, previously, it was just owned by a couple of people, but like now, like uh, I really want to just get the whole team involved in it because, you know, nothing I think personally is better than like releasing music that like dozens of this whole huge team fully supports. So um, that's kind of something that we're working on. We're also kind of like working on officially rolling out our agency uh, services. So we've kind of been doing them a little bit low key, uh, just people who message us asking for help. Uh, but we've been working on kind of an official rollout to really announce it officially uh, mm-hmm. and let the, the world know like, hey, we are doing these services, you know, we're helping people out. Uh, please let us know if you need assistance and just providing kind of the list mm-hmm. of these services. Um, on top of that, um, kind of like going into, I don't think the summer, maybe the summer, the summer is going to be mostly like social distance stuff, but mm-hmm. um, Target as well is trying to get into the live event space. So yeah. over the past couple of months, like or past year, because of all this growth that we've had, so many promoters have been reaching out to us saying, Hey, when you guys are ready to do a show, let me know. I would love to do like an electric hawk takeover in our city. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, I'll fully do everything for you guys. Just let me know. And it kind of sucks because like we've got these offers all the time in the past year yeah. and they're like for social distance or like table shows. And mm-hmm. it's just like, I don't want the first electric hawk thing to be you know, like a a seated show. Yeah. Yeah. I want, I want people to like really remember that experience. I want an Mm -hmm. insane lineup. I want people, you know, elbow to elbow, but like having a really good time just like, yeah, yeah, it's so that's the focus is live events and really just kind of scaling the business and getting more people educated and really just trying to expand Mm -hmm. and grow our team. That's so exciting. You got you guys have had so much growth in the last few years too. I'm sure it's kind of like flown by for you, but I agree with you. I think we've waited this long for live events. So I see what you you mean about wanting to have like that full event experience, like in full fledged force and everything like that. But I'm excited to see what you guys do. I'm really pumped for the festival and any live events and takeovers. Um, Definitely going to keep my eye on the artist agency and the label and any releases you have coming out. Uh, Last question for you. What are you doing in your off time? Like, what are you passionate about outside of work? (laughs) Oh, man. I mean, this is this is it. Yeah. (laughs) I I don't sleep. (laughs) Yeah, I I don't. I mean, I have another full time job as well. Uh, So it's kind of just like this and Electric Hawk is like my entire focus. Um, Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, I. I really can't say like electric Hawk. It's just, I put everything into it and I would not have it any other way. Uh, you mm-hmm. know, that's, that's what it is. And I'll keep doing what I can to make sure that like this kind of continues to succeed is every kind of bit of free time I have, like it's, it goes into something that has to do with electric Hawk. Like mm-hmm. if I have any kind of free time at all, I'll use it downtime to kind of just enjoy and like not use my brain preferably because right. <laughs> I'm under a lot of pressure, but yeah. When I do have free time to work on a hobby, it's always going to be Electric Hawk. It's going to be learning more visual skills and just like production wise, like what can I do to pick up a better skill to improve the operations for this team and the artists that I work with? Mm -hmm. I love it. This is why you guys are uh, having so much success. You can tell when somebody is super passionate about something. And uh, I'm really, really glad that we could connect and learn your story and hear everything that you guys have going on. Uh, Plug where everybody can connect with you and Electric Hawk. Yeah. Uh, on Twitter, we're electric Hawk. Uh, it's just electric underscore Hawk. Same thing for SoundCloud, uh, on Instagram, same thing as well. Electric underscore Hawk. And, uh, on Facebook, it's the electric Hawk, uh, on website is also just the electric Hawk.com as well. But that's where most of our content is, is at, whether it's publication, whether it's our record label releases or our playlists, et cetera. Um, that's where you'll find everything for, you know, what we're doing. Awesome. Love it. Thank you so much for your time. Daryl, hang tight. Everybody else, I will be back in just a second with EDM News. Appreciate you having me. All right, you guys, I am back. 
with some news for you guys and we have a lot to cover i don't know about you guys but it's getting like overwhelming it's officially we're going into festival season lineups are dropping left and right the industry is picking up again it is so 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 exciting i'm so pumped about everything it's a little overwhelming but we're gonna be good okay so let's start here so some of you guys might have seen pollen is presenting the day of the dead mouse which is going to be a dead mouse takeover in miami October 28th to the 31st, you're gonna get a Dead Mouse live show, Dead Mouse Unplugged, Test Pilot Set, which is his uh, techno alias, all kinds of shows, so that'll be really cool. So that's taking over Halloween weekend in Miami. Oh, sounds like an awesome event. Okay, I'm not even gonna be able to get through all of these, but the four major lineup announcements that I, actually, there's five, I forgot about Bonnaroo. Bonnaroo is one of them, that is officially dropped. Electric Zoo dropped their three-day lineup. Hard dropped their lineup. North Coast Festival, which I actually had never heard of before, but their lineup was so fire, it literally spread all over the internet. Um, and that's Labor Day weekend in Chicago, I believe. That one is incredible. And Imagine Music Festival, which I did a full um, review of the Imagine Music Festival lineup on my YouTube channel, if you guys wanna check that out. Um, I gave all types of artist recommendations. So yeah, everything looks really amazing. As of right now, I believe I will be attending Imagine Music Festival again, which is really, really exciting. Um, and yeah, besides that, I just have EDC tickets, Electric Forest tickets, and what else do I have? I might go to Elements Lakewood, I believe. Okay, I just thought of a new piece of news that I forgot about. Um, we actually do have some news from Electric Forest, which is so exciting. Um, I don't know if anybody else was like me, but I was holding my breath waiting for an announcement because we haven't heard anything and I was over here like, is it even going to happen? What's going on? But I know Insomniac is very busy <laughs> right now. So let me read to you the update that we have from the official Electric Forest team. So you guys, this reads, Greetings Forest family. As we are all aware, nationwide discussions related to large gatherings, vaccination timelines, social distancing regulations, General safety and many other COVID related considerations are evolving by the minute. We continue to closely watch the ever changing situation with an eye to when we can all reunite. Here is what we know at the moment. HQ is working tirelessly to navigate our potential options for 2021 and discussions with all parties involved are ongoing. If Electric Forest 2021, hold on, <clears throat> excuse me, is to happen, it will take place in August. I will repeat, if Electric Forest happens this year, it will be in August, you guys. So erase June off the calendar, it ain't happening in June. While we all miss each other tremendously and can't wait to connect again in the forest, the safety of the forest family remains the utmost priority. With a little bit more patience, we will have clarity when we desire. For now, we wanna make sure that clarity is based on every bit of information possible. Please expect to hear from Electric Forest HQ as soon as possible with a decision on this summer. So you guys, let's unpack this. I mean, one, I'm so happy they said something because a lot of us just kind of need to know to prepare like vacation days, finances, like figuring all of this out because a lot of these events are getting stacked on top of each other. I have heard online that the tentative dates they're looking at are August, I think it's the weekend of like the 20th to the 22nd. Um, a while back, they also posted something from like the uh, Rothbury Village Council meeting that the weekend before was an option as well, August like 13th to the 15th, but I'm hearing the 20th to 22nd is like potentially the leading option. So I personally had a family vacation scheduled for that week, so I don't know what I'm going to do. I will obviously go to Electric Forest, but there's just like a lot of things happening, so I know we're all awaiting decisions, but um, yeah, if it happens in August, I will be there 100% and it will be so, so exciting. So. Um, yeah, actually I didn't update you in the beginning, but since the last conversation we had, I actually ended up getting my first vaccination shot, which was really, really exciting and happened last minute. Um, and I'm thrilled. So I will, ha I will be fully vaccinated by April 23rd. So I am personally comfortable attending any events, traveling or anything like that after, um, my second shot. So yeah, if it picks up like this, I would think by August we will be totally fine. So, I mean, here's hoping that that happens. Um, okay, in other news, uh, we have a couple announcements from Zoo. Any Zoo fans are listening. Um, he announced his album Dreamland will be dropping on April 30th. Cannot wait for that new music Friday. And uh, he will be playing a massive show at Red Rocks called Dream Rocks on May 3rd to the 4th. If you guys are in the area and you've never seen Zoo, 
I would highly recommend that. He is an incredible musician and his live performances are awesome. So I would definitely go to that. Okay, we have some news from ADE, Amsterdam's dance event. Uh, exciting news from them as well. As of right now, they are planning to bring the event back October 13th to the 17th. It says we are gearing up to celebrate the reopening of our scene with you. And various venues and organizers are joining us on our mission. Audio Obscura, Awakenings, Concert Bow, Bow, I don't know, DG, <laughs> Digital DGTL, uh, Dockyard Elro, Into the Woods, etc. Um, there's going to be an Oliver Heldon show, which looks amazing. So you guys can already purchase tickets, I believe. But um, that's huge because I know Europe has been like very behind with everything. So, you know, again, really, really hoping for the best for all of them because that's like the biggest dance music conference in the world happening in October. Okay, any Dash Berlin fans out there? Some of you might have been following this already, obviously, if you are a fan, but um, there's been, I don't even know, maybe the past year, like there's been a legal battle between Jeffrey Satorius, who was a member of Dash, Dash Berlin, and his former group members um, over the name and branding, I guess the IP, Dash Berlin, and unfortunately he um, lost that legal battle. So he, there's a personal message from Jeffrey. Um, Dear friends, I'm writing this personal message to you today because I've experienced some of the most uplifting and joyful experiences that anyone could wish for together with you. As you may know by now, I have been having ongoing debates and several legal issues with my former partners in Dash Berlin over the past few years. That has always been really hard for me emotionally, but it felt as if something it was worth fighting for. Unfortunately, it has been sentenced last week that the Dash Berlin trademarks must be transferred to my former partners in Dash Berlin and that as of March 17th, I can no longer use the name Dash Berlin as I've done for the past 13 years. Um, and I know he says it feels very unfair to him. It's something he has to deal with. So if you guys hear the name Jeffrey Satorius, the person you know and love is Dash Berlin, like you, you will recognize him. That's Jeffrey Satorius now. So go show him some love and support, please. I was such a big fan of Dash Berlin. He's so much fun to see live. It's been like years at this point, but um, go show Jeffrey Satorius some love. You guys, if you love uplifting trance, you will definitely love his sound. All right, I told you we have a lot of news this week. I'm almost through it, I promise. Okay, uh, and other festival news, Firefly Festival, any East Coast ravers up in this house, um, is officially gonna be happening September 23rd to the 26th. That is a camping festival that takes place in Delaware. It's usually a mixed genre festival. I've never attended, but um, I've heard good things. So that's going on. Um, unfortunately for my Canadians, Shambhala Festival announced that they are going to be canceling this year's event and they will be back in 2022, which totally sucks. I know a lot of people were waiting to see what happens, but it's a different situation in Canada and they're not open to doing that. So um, they will be back next year, next summer in 2022. And I think that's it pretty much. Yeah, that was it with the news, you guys. Woo, okay, we made it through. <laughs> Thank you so, so much for listening, you guys. Seriously, I am feeling incredible about these upcoming months. I cannot wait to see you guys and meet you in person and plan some meetups at events when it's all safe and again thank you for showing love and support um, the best thing you guys can do is tell somebody about rave culture cast share it to your instagram stories send a link to a friend invite them to the discord group um, all of that is tremendously helpful and i really really appreciate it from the bottom of my heart and again Stay tuned for all these big things coming up. The Plur Mini Collection dropping Wednesday, April 21st. Pick up some merch. Um, and then, of course, again, if you guys are interested in starting your own podcast, I'm here to help you do the damn thing. I'm going to be coaching a course on it. Um, stay tuned on my social media pages at Emma Capotis. And, yeah, and I will be doing a free webinar on April 13th at 8 p.m. Eastern that you can register for. Come learn everything you need to know before starting a podcast. So with all that being said, thank you guys so much for listening. I hope you have an incredible week this week. Love you all and I will see you next Wednesday. Bye guys.